this is hell. We have cut ourselves off from nature. So is it any wonder that climate change is not the top news story or our politicians' number one concern? Yes, something still can be done about climate change, but that's going to take a radical transformation right now. It doesn't look like this world, or at least the United States, is up to. Here to get us caught up on the state of climate change, returning to This Is Hell, Andreas Malm is author of The Progress of the Storm, Nature and Society in a Warming World. Welcome back to This Is Hell, Andreas. Thank you so much, Chuck. Pleasure you, to be with you again. You may remember Andreas being on our show back in December 2015 to discuss his book, Fossil Capital, The Rise of Steam Power and the Roots of Global Warming, which won the Isaac and Tamara Deutscher Memorial Prize, which is awarded annually to a book which exemplifies the best and most innovative new writing in or about the Marxist tradition. You write, we continue, live, we continue to live on a stage where there is nothing but the present past and future alike have dissolved into a perpetual now leaving us imprisoned in a moment without links backwards or forwards only the the dimension of space extends in all directions across the seamless surface of a globalized world in which everyone is connected to everyone else through uncountable threads but time has ceased flowing what do you mean by time has ceased flowing has it ceased flowing Just recently, did something happen? Is this unique in human history? Well, this is a retelling of a diagnosis of the so-called postmodern condition. It's it's not it's not really my analysis. It's it's one developed by Frederick Jameson, the American cultural theorist. But I think it pinpoints a certain type of logic that is most um, visible today, perhaps in the way that people interact with their. technologies, notably smartphones, the way that people are glued to the screens and uh, caught up in a perpetual flow of uh, information that they can uh, access by swiping the screen or touching a button. And this makes for a a, a kind of mindset where um, space extends in all directions in the sense that you, you can access anything instantly, but there is precious little in the sense of the being integrated into any kind of history with a deep past and a deep future and um, a a strange way of isolating oneself from the biosphere and uh, locking oneself into a cloister of of digital life, of virtual life, as it were, uh, precisely at the moment when we need to be more closely attuned to what's going on in physical nature, and uh, to extend our attention spans to very, very long-term processes, such as climate change playing out for the next thousands of years, depending on what we do now. And it's a bit of a cultural paradox that precisely when we need to be more, uh, more integrated into our material environment and be uh, um, more... Uh, attentive to the very long-term consequences of our daily actions, we are caught up in this um, extreme fragmentation of the in- of the attention span and the uh, this the cyber sphere or the the or the augmented reality of our digital life. And you write how we are already experiencing climate change. There are people who are still in climate change denial, or people who think that it's going to be happening to us in the future. But you point out in many ways how we're already being affected by climate change. And you write, the experience is becoming well-nigh universal. A majority of the human population has been exposed to abnormally warm weather over the past decade. Such man-made weather, however, is never made in the present. Why don't we perceive man-made weather being made in the present? Why don't we see the impact that we are currently having on climate change that we are having it right now. Why do we always see it as something uh, uh, that occurred in the past with CO2 emissions due to 19th or 20th century capitalism? Well, I think that the perception of climate change is very different uh, among different groups of people and in different places. And that that depends on uh, the the position one has in in the world economy and uh, how one's daily life is linked to fossil fuels and also ideological perception. 
So, for instance, it has been demonstrated again and again that people that are deeply invested in conservative ideology and climate denialism uh, have such strong blinkers that they uh, that they fail to adapt their views to an actual personal experience of weather shock. So, in your country, in the U.S., for instance, you, you've had a, a, an a, I mean, innumerable cases of climate-related shocks over the past years. But some people are capable of absorbing these shocks into their perception that, no, there is no global warming, or these are just uh, natural fluctuations. And that's because of uh, certain, uh, certain mechanisms of suppressing facts that are extremely strong among some people. And it's not only for this uh, uh, phenomenon in the U.S., it's very much a phenomenon here in Europe nowadays as well. When we see the rise and rise and rise of the far right, that often denies that climate change is a problem that we need to do anything about, even though Europeans experience more and more of the climate impact. Uh, on the other hand, some people on this planet have no choice but to realize that they are caught up in a war. So, for instance, I was on the island of Dominica last August. Three weeks after I got home, Hurricane Maria crashed into that island and just completely raised the whole island, just destroyed all of the infrastructure and, uh, and cut off the forest cover in one, uh, in one blow. And the people uh, of Dominica have, have since developed a, a, a kind of um, almost martial mentality or, or uh, discourse where they, they see themselves as caught up in a war against climate change and fighting for their very survival as a people and as a nation. So in some parts of the globe where you, you, you see poor people directly getting their lives destroyed by climate change, you have a very keen appreciation of what's going on. But the, the perceptions of, of, uh, of global warming are, are very much differentiated according to, um, to, to social position and to ideology. Now, I want to get talked a little bit about uh, this concept of pre-trauma that we're already having from climate change. But you write when I want to stay on this idea of time just for a moment. Uh, you write when early 20th century philosopher Walter Benjamin roamed the cities of interwar Europe. He jotted down a signpost for further investigation, and it read on the double meaning of the term temp. Tomp in uh, French, that's T-E-M-P-S, Tomp as in weather and time. Most likely the semantic overlap is rooted in the primordial experience of the seasonal cycle drawing the calendar of labor the older days when uh, the olden days when sun cloud rain and snow set the rhythm of hunting sowing reaping and all sorts of other activities what happens what do you think happens when weather no longer works like clockwork when time and weather become disconnected well, well, yeah, I think there is a, a new kind of connection between time and weather because uh, when you have extreme weather events that are linked to climate change, they are the result of past combustion of fossil fuels. So to take again the example of the, the, the Caribbean hurricanes that, that struck uh, um, islands such as Dominica, they were the result of all the greenhouse gases that had built up in the atmosphere over time, over a couple of centuries. So uh, extreme weather today uh, is, is linked to a particular history of uh, burning fossil fuels. And when that history uh, erupts into the present, it's, it makes for, it creates a new kind of relation to time. History falls in on the present, so to speak, uh, precisely because physically the, the climatic events that we experience wouldn't have happened if it were not for the, the two centuries of ever deeper investment in the fossil economy. So um, uh, this is also, of course, what, what, we, what we refer to when we say that soon it would be too late. What that means is that if we continue to build up greenhouse gases in the atmosphere at this rate, we'll experience climatic shocks that we'll, we will be unable to deal with in a reasonable way. Um, and uh, uh, in that sense, the past is always catching up on us in a warming world. We, we, get, uh, we get chained to a past that we cannot uh, alter because it's the past. Um, and uh, uh, it, it, that is also a reason to, to I think, 
investigate that history and see what has brought us into this to this warming place and and uh, um, uh, how did we get get caught up in this mess over the past centuries and what can we do about it before it really is too late and it's it's becoming later by the hour that's the the the, the, the very special temporality of climate change the more greenhouse gases there are out in the atmosphere the more severe the impacts will be and so on and so on and you were talking about in dominica the uh response by the citizenry to react to climate change as like a kind of war that was taking place. And you're right, we should conclude that building a new coal-fired power plant or continuing to operate an old one or drilling for oil or expanding an airport or planning for a highway is now irrational violence. If we view such developments as irrational violence, how different, differently would we address such developments? Would we ch- change to a point of view that the people of Dominica have, where we would react to this as a war? And is that a good strategy for combating climate change? Yeah, yeah, I actually do think that the war analogy makes sense. And uh, many people have drawn parallels to the current emergency with the emergency faced by the United States, for instance, uh, with the outbreak of the Second World War, when all the nation's resources were directed towards one single goal, namely defeating the enemy. And that required that the, the state took some very radical control over the economy and, for instance, ordered the car companies to cease producing private cars and only produce tanks and other war materials. And uh, we're in a similar moment in the sense that we're facing an emergency, and it isn't a, a war that is uh, that we can pin down to uh, uh, an, an alien entity such as Nazi Germany, but it's it's an emergency that um, that we, as a planetary community, as humankind, as a whole, uh, that we are facing, and it requires dramatic measures similar to the ones uh, in, in the war emergency uh, uh, in the Second World War. And that would mean that governments start to take some tough decisions for a start, a moratorium on new coal-fired power plants or oil uh, platforms or pipelines, and then uh, some, some very stringent regulations and decisions for how to shift completely from fossil fuels to renewable energy in a very short period of time. What we're seeing now is that the renewable energy sectors around the world are growing, but at the same time you have additional airports, you have new pipelines, you have a continued expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure around the world, and as long as, as that happens, it doesn't matter how many solar panels we put up or, or wind farms we build, we have to completely shift from the one energy source to the other. And I don't see that uh, any other agent can do that than states, governments that actually make emergency decisions about what is required. The only viable alternative, uh, as far as I uh, am aware, is some kind of geoengineering, which means that, again, states would have to intervene, but not in the economic system, but in the climate system, by injecting soot into the atmosphere or something like that to cool the planet. So uh, because it's so late and because so much has been damaged and so much has been burned, the only entity that can potentially mitigate uh, the disasters is, I think, the state, pretty much as in, in a war scenario. It can be either by geoengineering or it can be by some kind of economic planning. And I very much prefer the second because uh, uh, geoengineering comes with many uh, consequences that we don't know how they will play out. But, you know, we're told here in the United States, we're raised to believe that the market will solve everything. If there is such high demand, global demand for a fight against climate change, then why can't we expect or depend upon the private sector to fulfill that demand, supply that demand for a fight against climate change? Why do we have to look towards the state? Why can't we look toward the private sector? Because there are plenty of people in the private sector, or not plenty of people, there are actually quite few, but they make a lot of money from digging up fossil fuels and burning them, or give, selling them to others who burn them. Uh, it's quite clear at the, from the current situation in the U.S. that these are very powerful 
corporations and and public figures even now they are so well represented in in, in the Trump government. These are people who um, who profit enormously from the consumption of fossil fuels and who will do all they can to defend and uh, and prolong the fossil economy because their whole business model is to take up oil and coal and gas out of the ground and sell it on the market to get it burned. And uh, uh, if we now need to cease to, to terminate the production of fossil fuels, that would mean retiring an enormous amount of investment and prematurely liquidating all the capital that is sunk into those assets, such as oil terminals or uh, or uh, power plants burning coal uh, or coal mines. If we were to close all of these things, some people would lo- lose an enormous amount of money, namely the owners of these assets. And therefore, they are doing all they can to fight back against the demand for a transition uh, away from fossil fuels. That is how the real actual market works. You mentioned E. Ann Kaplan's study, Climate Trauma, Foreseeing the Future in Dystopian Film and Fiction. You write how Kaplan tells the story of how she herself was caught up in Hurricane Sandy, and at one point, as she tried to return to her apartment by climbing dark stairs, suffered a panic attack. The experience led her to develop the syndrome of pre-trauma, not the usual post-traumatic stress disorder in which people suffer past wounds, but rather fear of a future terrifying event of a similar kind. Our culture as a whole, Kaplan suggests, is now developing pre-trauma with more and more film, television, literature, journalism inflicted by the creeping uh, insight that catastrophic climate change is approaching. Consumers of popular culture make up a pre-traumatized population living with a sense of an uncertain future in an unreliable natural environment. How much do you see society acting as if it has pre-trauma when it comes to looming climate change? Are, are we not addressing climate change as much as we should be because of suffering from pre-traumatic stress disorder? I, I think that... It's- Kaplan's point is that we should take pre-trauma seriously and perhaps suffer from it more than we do. But but her point is that if you look at popular culture these days, it's uh, absolutely suffused with with the theme of apocalypse, of uh, the 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 end of days, of uh, Earth in crisis. And particularly if you look at films uh, from the day after tomorrow to Interstellar to Elysium to yeah. Well, it's an endless stream of films portraying the collapse of, uh, of the Earth as we know it. And this is, according to Kaplan, a kind of cultural processing of our predicament. Uh, most of us know at some level of our consciousness that we are in dire straits and we're facing the prospect of a breakdown in, uh, in the Earth's uh, basic functioning uh, notably the climate system, and this uh, this uh, vague fear is expressed in, for instance, those films about uh, about apocalypse, about uh, the end of the days, and all of that. And um, I think that Kaplan's argument is that we should take those films seriously and uh, and face up to our predicament and feel a little bit of panic because it's rational to do so when you're facing a severe danger and act on that panic, not only fantasizing about it or imagining the outcomes, uh, what the world will look like when, uh, when the sea has risen uh, so and so many inches or when the, the deserts have expanded as, uh, as fiction and film are uh, quite skilled at doing. But we need to, to also act purposefully and politically on the insights that we have got from climate science about what we're facing. But this trauma is driven by actions that, as you were pointing out in your book and during this conversation, took place in the past that cannot be undone. So it would seem nothing can be done about this pre-trauma. How much do you think we are currently lashing out in other ways unrelated to climate change due to any pre-traumatic stress disorder we may be collectively suffering today? Yeah, that's a very good question. There are actually 
some researchers recently who have argued that climate change is conducive to a general feeling of anxiety and worry and fear and uncertainty about uh, our ways of life, and that those feelings might in fact contribute to things like xenophobia, uh, using uh, immigrant communities as targets for those feelings. Complete, of course, these, these targets are completely unrelated to the actual source of those feelings, but human psyches are not always rational. And racism and fascism in particular have a, a known record for being able to channel emotions in very irrational and destructive ways. And uh, I'm not the one to, to prove this or to, to present any evidence for it, but perhaps the climate crisis shakes people's um, faith in their ways of life in a manner that push, pushes some of them to, towards um, blaming innocent victims for, for causing a downfall of, of, uh, of the present order. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a possibility that we need to be aware of, I think. That extreme weather can lead to extreme politics. Is that, do you think that's the case on both the left and the right, that extreme weather can lead to not just extreme right-wing politics, but potentially extreme left-wing politics as well? Well, yeah, I, don't, I, I think... Uh, I would never equate the two. I think uh, extreme politics from the left has a completely different uh, logic than, than extreme politics from the right, which tends to target people on the basis of their ethnic identity. Extreme politics from the left, if any such exists these days, uh, tends to target um, the, the wealthiest, the upper class, for what they have done. So, uh, I mean, to be honest, I would hope for more extreme left politics due to extreme weather. I, I don't see very much of it, unfortunately. But uh, if you read military strategists from uh, Pentagon and, and other uh, institutions around the world, you will see them uh, being quite worried about how uh, catastrophic climate change in the decades ahead can induce riot, civil disturbances, um, a resurgence of radical left ideologies and things like that, because uh, people will be very seriously squeezed and might see some privileged few people uh, still uh, enjoying um, uh, their, their, their plenty, their, their fortunes. And that, that I think, uh, is a mixture that certainly can create the ground for social conflict. How much do you think any getting back to this pre-traumatic stress disorder? How how much do you think that that the pre pre-traumatic stress disorder leads to or creates a fertile environment for climate change den denialism? Are people freaking out about the potential for climate change to the point that they are denying climate change? Yeah, yeah, I certainly think that's that's one of many mechanisms of repression that is operating. That it, this is just too scary a reality to acknowledge. So we better just imagine that it doesn't exist. That's also a well-known human psychological adaptation mechanism that you you just you can't face up to the threat, and it's more convenient and it, it gives you greater security just to reject the the existence of the threat. And that made me think about a recent conversation we had with uh, journalist uh, Johan Hari about the epidemic of unhappiness, the epidemic of depression. How much do you think climate change is making us unhappy, even causing an epidemic of unhappiness? Yeah, well, again, I think it's, it's hard to pinpoint the exact causal link, but uh, certainly in, in this country, in Sweden, more and more psychologists have begun to, to speak about climate depression or people suffering from, from that syndrome almost in a clinical sense, that people are so worried and feel so powerless about global warming that they become depressed because they know how much is at stake. Um, I, I think quite a few people around the world feel seriously worried about this and it has an impact on their lives. Even more so, of course, if you're suffering actual material impact, such as a destroyed house or a lost uh, child or something like that, then it's, it's making you really depressed. And I, I believe, for, to, to, go, to return to Dominique, I believe people there are suffering from some really 
really concrete climate depression because climate change has wrecked their lives and they're not happy about it. Uh, yeah. Uh, you write that permanent connectivity, that is to the Internet, for instance, enacts the final capitalist mirage of post-history. Jonathan Crary writes in his Searing 24-7, Late Capitalism and the Ends of Sleep, it is the consum- uh, consummation of a homogenous present, a space where the past has been erased and everything can be accessed on demand in an instant. Not only does it negate natural rhythms, such as the need for sleep, it also offers a cloister away from the new temp, the new time and weather. Then you quote uh, Crary writing, the more one identifies with the insubstantial electronic surrogates for the physical self, the more one seems to conjure an exemption from the bio side underway everywhere on the planet. And you add, the more one withdraws from the virtual cocoon, the more one detaches from things taking place in nature. To what extent, then, are we not addressing climate change in the present because we have purposely, we have chosen to cut ourselves off from the outside world and nature? How much have we created a virtual world that works as some sort of buffer between us and nature, between us and climate change? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say, again, exactly how much. It's hard even to, to, to present any kind of uh, absolute evidence for this being the case. But I think that uh, there is a, a vast We just lost Andreas. I know that clicking sound when I hear it. Alex, can you please get Andreas back on the line when you get a chance? I would really appreciate it. So I was asking you about how much uh, we have cut ourselves off from the present. You were saying that that's kind of something that isn't really quantifiable. Uh, So to what what extent uh, have we already accepted climate change, even those who are in denial? Is denial itself a form of accepting climate change? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. I think uh, lots of people who, who deny, explicitly deny climate change uh, are at some subconscious level aware about the existence of climate change, but uh, uses the denial to, use the denial to, to pretend that the problem isn't there. And uh, it, that, that's also almost a general predicament in our societies, and it doesn't require explicit denial of climate science for, for that to happen, you know, in, in most countries, including my own in Sweden, people know about climate change and accept the science, but go on living as though nothing in particular was happening. Uh, and uh, living in denial is a, a, a very common predicament right now, and it makes it, of course, very much more difficult to do anything uh, about climate change. Uh, what What's needed is uh, a mass, a mass movement, uh, a, a mass. Uh, I mean, it would be pretentious to call it a mass awakening, but some call some some kind of um, of facing up to the realities and stop living in denial about what's going on. You write that uh, great blunder and trespasser climate change sweeps back and forth between the two regions traditionally referred to as nature and society. What do you mean by climate change moving back and forth between nature and society? It mixes elements of both. And um, that creates a a particular theoretical or analytical problem. It makes it difficult to say exactly where nature ends and society begins. So if you have a hurricane coming to you, it's a natural phenomenon, it would seem. But at the same time, we know that that hurricane, in so far as it's beefed up by climate change, is the result of social events uh, related to the combustion of fossil fuels. So climate change mixes the two in an uncertain dialectic or combination. Um, I still think that it's, it's very important to analytically distinguish between natural and social components of a thing such as climate change. We know, for instance, that uh, warm oceans take up more space than cold ones. So when the temperature rises in the oceans, you have a thermal expansion of the seas. And this is completely natural in the sense that humans can't do anything about it. We can't decree that oceans stop expanding when they become hotter because that's the law of nature. On the other hand, we have uh, 
still a, a, a mind-boggling quant amount of subsidies going to fossil fuel companies around this world. And that's a completely social component of the problem. Because humans can, in fact, governments can very easily terminate su such subsidy. Uh, so uh, climate change is a mixture of nature and society. But we need to analytically tell the social and the natural components apart because um, what we can do is to change the social part of the picture. What we can't do is to change the natural consequences of what we do. So we know that, that the seas will continue to rise if, uh, if uh, glaciers melt and things like that. It's a fact of nature. And precisely for that reason, we need to... Um, to alter our social ways of doing things when it comes to energy. So we've been talking about how we've cut ourselves off from nature. We've been talking about how we have even cut ourselves off from this kind of sense of time. You write, history has sprung alive through a nature that has done likewise. We are only in the very early stages, but already our daily life, our psychic experience, our cultural responses... Even our political show signs of being sucked back by planetary, planetary uh, forces into the whole of time. The present dissolving into past and future alike. Postmodernity seems to be visited by its antithesis, a condition of time and nature conquering ever more space. Call it the warming condition. How will nature and time be different, even reassert themselves during the warming condition, and how well do you think we will be able to adapt to the warming condition? The worst, the worst case scenario is that the warming condition just accelerates and we get this two, three, four, five, six degrees uh, of uh, warming. And uh, in that case, uh, the, 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 um, the, part, the, the various parts of the Earth's system will start to break down and the natural consequences that will play out will be of, of such magnitude that we cannot meaningfully adapt to them. Um, and then we really are caught up in, the, in a past that we can't do anything about if that happens. Now, I don't believe that, we, that that is a destiny, that it's predetermined and inevitable. There is still significant space for action. We can uh, cut fossil fuel consumption, and we can cut CO2 emissions to near zero over the next few decades, preferably until the middle of the century. And we can perhaps also move towards negative emissions when you actually start to um, undo some of the damages from the past by taking carbon dioxide down out from the atmosphere and reinsert them into the underground. Uh, that might require some advanced technologies that are very uncertain, but uh, it's, it's that kind of a, a, a war against the past, to speak metaphorically, that might be required to stabilize climate on this, this earth. And that's a task that we'll, uh, we'll have to work on for a long time, for decades, perhaps even centuries, before we uh, return to a stable climate. But it's, it's hard to see how we can do anything less than strive for a stabilization of the climate, because we know that a complete destabilization of the climate is not compatible with continued uh, organized human life on this planet. And you point out in your book how, you know, zero emissions is a far easier technology to have and an innovation to, uh, it's, an, it's something that we actually can have right now, zero emissions, but negative emissions is something that is so technologically beyond us right now. It's going to be a lot more difficult if we continue to uh, cause climate change. You write, any theory for the warming condition should have the struggle to stabilize climate with the demolition of the fossil econo economy, the necessary first step. As, fit, as its practical, if only ideal, point of reference. It should clear up space for action and resistance. If anything, destroying the fossil fuel economy, uh, economy is viewed as impractical. That is, there has not, there's got to be a way to both address climate change and not have an impact on our economy. So why do you see ending the fossil economy as practical in the face of climate change? 
practical in the sense that we have the known, uh, proven existing technologies required to get away from fossil fuels. We have renewable energy, and uh, it works better by the day. It's becoming cheaper by the day. Uh, it's 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 technically feasible to shift away completely from fossil fuels, and this has been demonstrated again and again that the world economy can be powered solely by wind and, and sun and some addition of uh, thermal and, uh, and water power, although no one really believes in massive expansion of water power any longer. But the other forms of renewable energy are capable of a massive expansion that could replace fossil fuels. And uh, that can be done without any serious harm to the, the Earth system, unlike geoengineering in its more uh, radical forms, uh, such as solar radiation management, where you try to reduce the amount of incoming sunlight into the planet to cool it down. These uh, technologies come with, uh, with uh, threats of, uh, of very problematic uh, consequences and therefore shouldn't be deemed realistic. Unfortunately, nowadays, many politicians more or less count on such technologies as saving us in the future because uh, they, uh, they aren't uh, courageous enough or they, they don't feel that they have a mandate or they're not being pushed to actually intervene in the capitalist economy and force it on another track. That's the ultimate taboo in these times, and therefore uh, politicians prefer to hope that some kind of future technology will save us when it's unproven and potentially very dangerous. How much has the commodification of nature created climate, climate change? Because you write, more specifically, the theoretical obliteration of nature mimics the practical attempts by capital to subsume it under the law of value. Indeed, as many anti-constructionists have argued, it is the latter that makes the for former even plausible. Only in a society that strives to turn every bit of nature into profit can the idea that nature has no independent existence take root. So can climate change be addressed without considering and reexamining uh, re the idea of commodification of nature? I, I, maybe at the end of the process, it, it will have to include a break with the idea of nature as a commodity that we can control and optimize for our use. Uh, and we need a, a much more humble attitude, so to speak, uh, to the rest of nature and to desist from, from extreme domination of nature. Fossil fuels are really all about dominating nature, about using a type of energy that seems to fit our purposes, that we can control in time and space. A shift to renewable energy, as Naomi Klein and others have pointed out, would require more of humility, more of adaptation to natural forces, and learning to live with, with nature as it is, not as, as we, or rather as, as capital, uh, wants it to be. Um, so I think uh, at the end of, uh, of a transition away from fossil fuels, we will come out with a different relationship to nature. Yeah. And you also point out that uh, you discuss the impact of materialism on climate change, and you write how political theorist Jane Bennett justifies the material non-human turn with the voluminous mountain of things that today surround those of us living in corporate capitalist neoliberal shopping as religion cultures. These mountains demand that we give the alluring objects themselves, the commodities, pride of place in our thinking. The wealth of societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails appears as an immense collection of thing kings. To what extent will our sense of materialism have to change in order to save us or future generations from climate change? Well, the, what you just quoted now from, from my book is part of an argument against so-called new materialism, which uh, claims that things have agency on their own. So things like uh, clouds or fatty acids or power plants or, yeah goods that you shop in the, the local store, they have agency and uh, their own will, almost, that they impose on us. And I don't think that that is uh, a useful materialist analysis of, uh, of our time. I think we need to retain a distinction between humans as being rather special in their agency, in their, uh, in their capacity to choose, for instance, 
between various types of energy. Um, no other species has that kind of ability to to consume all sorts of energy and pick between them as we do. So um, we have uh, we are material beings and we're completely inter interwoven with other material beings, but we have a particular um, role, uh, mostly a destructive one right now, on this planet, uh, and uh, that role derives from some exceptional human characteristics that are related to the, the type of agency, uh, the kind of intentions that we can have. Um, and I don't see new materialism, which is very popular in some academic circles, as an analytically uh, tenable way forward in this situation. I think we need to uh, assume the, the very special responsibility that comes with what some like to call the Anthropocene, the, the epoch of humankind, when, when human actions determine the trajectory of this planet. You write, in Climate Crisis, Psychoanalysis, and Radical Ethics, Donna M. Orange chases the ghosts of colonial history that haunt this global warming world and suggests that an unprocessed history of enslaving others primes privileged white people to callousness. And you quote Orange writing, blindness to our ancestors' crimes and to the way we whites continue to live from those crimes keeps the suffering of those already exposed to the devastation of climate crisis impossible for us to see or feel. In a few minutes, we're going to be talking with award-winning journalist Vegas Tenold about uh, his five-year investigation into the far right here into white supremacists and white nationalists here in the United States. How much is climate change the result of white supremacy? How much does that keep whites denying climate change because they cannot admit that the cost of their privilege has been the environment, if not the planet? a crucial link, I think. Uh, the, the fossil economy as it evolved in the 19th century rested on white supremacy in the sense that it was the invention by, uh, of, of Englishmen and other Western Europeans who, uh, with force, imposed this invention on others, brought coal and steam and uh, related to technologies to Egypt and Nigeria and China against the will, largely, of the peoples of those countries and used those technologies to enrich themselves and were quite explicit about it. Uh, if you read all the British uh, literature on steam power, for instance, you will find many references to, to the power that steam gives us to, um, to destroy the rabble of the world and to take um, all that we need from the, Af the interior of the African continent or the Indian subcontinent. So there is a, a very clear historical link between uh, racial capitalism, if you like, and, uh, the, and the use of fossil fuels on a large scale. Uh, that's, that's one part of the picture. Another part of the picture is the, the fact that most people that today suffer serious losses due to climate change are people of color around the world. And white people that who are fairly affluent in Europe and the United States are shielded largely from the consequences of climate change. So there is a color gradation to the problem. And uh, um, I think that um, the surge in the support for the far right is, is related to this and will be more related to this in the future because we can easily see scenarios where lots of people of color move towards let's say Europe, for instance, because their homelands have been rendered uh, more or less uninhabitable by climate change. And then you will have white populations in Europe who are deeply influenced by xenophobia, not the least Islamophobia, and what will happen the day when, when, uh, when you see movements of people on a completely different magnitude than what we saw in 2015 when people in Europe freaked out about a so-called refugee crisis. And since then, we've seen a, a, yet another surge in the support for, for the far right. Uh, will, will, will white, relatively privileged people in Europe open up their countries to climate refugees? Or will they uh, try to defend their borders and keep people out to, uh, to enjoy their privileges? I think that's a, a question we will have to uh, deal with, uh, with in, the, in the relatively near future. And you write that the warming conditions spells the death of affirmative politics. Negativity is our only chance now. Why does climate change 
end affirmative politics and what does negativity offer that affirmation does not? Well, in very concrete terms, we need to destroy things. We need to, to stop things. We need to um, not affirm things like coal-fired power plants or accelerate um, automobility. We need to terminate those things. That's the element of negativity. There, there is no way that we can get out of the warming condition or, or out of prevent uh, climate breakdown without negatively uh, uh, destroying and terminating things that are dangerous. You write that some on the left maintain that progressives should not stoke panic. They ought to be less catastrophic or er, catastrophist and apocalyptic. But if we accept the principles of climate realism and stay up to date with the science, the boot is entirely on the other foot. Psychoanalyst and philosopher, as we were just quoting a little bit ago, Donna Orange, points to the classic psychoanalytical embarrassment of Sigmund Freud himself, who refused to see Nazi annexation coming and only escaped Vienna at the very last moment, leaving several family members to perish. Then you quote, Orange writing, the parallel with our climate emergency is clear. When we cannot panic appropriately, we cannot take fittingly radical action. How much does radical action then, the radical action we need, depend upon panic and fear? Uh, To be honest, I don't think panic and fear are really the most productive emotions here. I think climate anger should be the the prime emotion of our days. We need more anger. It's it's, uh, fairly well known in psychology that the, the emotion most conducive to action isn't fear or panic, but it is anger. And there are many reasons to be angry. Uh, There are reasons to be angry with uh, the fact that oil corporations continue to profit enormously, horrendously, from delivering more fuels to the fire. There is reason to be angry about how much power oil corporations have in this world, notably in the U.S. There is reason to be angry about Swedish politicians uh, expanding airports and building new highways when we need to do exactly the opposite. And I think that is the, 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 the emotional force with the greatest potential to change things. And if such anger is also combined with panic, then sure. But I think we, what, what we need most is indignation at this time. We have been speaking with Andreas Malm, author of The Progress of the Storm, Nature and Society in a Warming World. And you can actually win Andreas's book by having the best response to this week's question from hell. And we'll be telling you what that is in just a moment. Andreas was on our show back in December 2015 to discuss his book, Fossil Capital. And if you have not read that book or checked it out yet, you should definitely check it out. It won the uh, Isaac and Tamara Deutscher Memorial Prize, which is awarded annually to a book which exemplifies the best and most innovative new writing in or about the Marxist tradition. One last question for you, Andreas. And as always, our final question is the question from hell. Question we hate to ask, you might hate to answer. Our audience is going to hate your response. What climate change uh, deniers have been saying all along that all capitalism is, is a fable, maybe even created by the Chinese, made up to overthrow capitalism. Can we end climate change? Can we effectively address climate change and still be capitalist? Well, to be honest, I hope so, because it's very difficult to abolish capitalism. It has proven exceedingly hard over the past two centuries. So I hope, given what little time we have, that it's possible to address climate change without getting rid of capitalism altogether. But I do think that um, any serious mitigation uh, policy will inevitably conflict and clash with capitalist interests. Whether that clash uh, leads to a a complete abolition of capitalism, I I will leave unsaid. Uh, Perhaps it's not necessary. But some capital will definitely have to be taken down, most obviously the kind of fossil capital that profits immediately from the combustion of fossil fuels. So any sensible climate politics contains anti-capitalist elements, and that's why it's so hard to progress on this issue. Andreas, a pleasure again to have you back here on This Is Hell, and we'll stay in touch with you because we definitely want to have you back on the show again. Always enjoyable to have a conversation with you, sir. Likewise. Thank you so much, Chuck. Take care.
You've been listening to a This Is Hell interview. For more interview hell and to support the show, visit thisishell.com. <laughs>